Good morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. 44 years ago, this young kid, son of a steel worker, went to Annapolis, Maryland to go to school there, leaving Butler, PA behind and saying, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go here for four years. It's free. Do five years in the Navy. Move on and go make money somewhere. Well, as Roy Hobbs said in the movie The Natural, things don't always turn out the way we plan. I joined the submarine community. I married up, like a lot of good people did. And here I am today, lucky enough to be the Chief of Naval Operations, leading the finest Navy in the world, representing 325,000 sons and daughters, many of them from this area, 200,000 civilians, and 70,000 Navy reservists who are out and around the world today, where it matters, doing what matters, to protect freedom and to make sure the economic lines of communication are open. So I'm a lucky man here standing before you today. I want to talk to you today about two elements of leadership, accountability and second chances. And I'd like to do that through a story. So bear with me. 38 years ago, a nuclear submarine almost sank by the pier. I mean, it would have been a calamity and you think, how can that be? Well, first of all, a nuclear submarine today costs about a billion and a half dollars. That's a lot of money at risk. About half price back then, but still a lot of money at risk. So how can this be if it's in port? Well, when you go to work on ships in port, it's a very, it can be a dangerous situation, one that requires a lot of, a lot of vigilance. So here's what's going to happen. When you do maintenance on a submarine, sometimes you need to go in and take the valves out, move the piping, and go to work on it. You got to make sure that the intake on the hull is covered so you don't bring water in when you take these things apart. It's a very kind of uh, complex situation. Divers come down, they come down with drawings, they check with the officer of the day in charge of the ship to make sure that this is all coordinated, and they bring what's called a flange. It looks about the size of a pizza pan, about a 12-inch pizza pan, and they'll bolt that on the side of the submarine. Well, you gotta make sure you bolt it. When I say on the side of the submarine, you, you blank it off so that when you take the piping out, the water doesn't come in. Well, you better get this right, because if you don't, the water's gonna come in. So, it's, like I said, people sign off for this and say, we put this on, say thank you very much. The duty officer signs for it, and we have all counted for what's about to take place. So that happens on day one. On day two, workers come down to take a valve apart, and they're unbolting these large bolts, pull the thing out, and here comes the water. An onrush of water, the size of a pizza pan coming inside here, and but for the effort of some fairly heroic sailors, big guys, pushing this thing back in, putting the nuts back in, we might have lost that submarine, because that was kind of uncontrolled flooding. So. They were able to put that back in, but there was a lot of water on the submarine, probably almost up to your knee. They dewatered it, and it was time to do an investigation. How could this happen? We have all these procedures to take place. There needs to be an accounting for what took place. So that was done. Depositions were made. It all came together. And the commanding officer of that submarine received the documentation. And here's what was decided. Letters of reprimand would be distributed to the officer of the day, it's a junior officer, the day they put this flange on, to the officer of the day that they went to take these things out, and to the divers and the diving supervisor. The commanding officer said, well, wait a minute. I, I'm not going to deliver these letters of reprimand. By the way, a letter of reprimand, it's a career ender. You won't promote to your next level. It's a very serious incident. He said, I'm not going to deliver these letters of reprimand. I'm accountable for everything that goes on on this unit, this submarine of mine. This is my responsibility. If anybody's getting a letter of reprimand, give it to me. My junior officers did the job that they said they were going to do. They believed what these divers had said was true, and they took their word for it. I'm not going to deliver these. Go ahead and bring it to me. That's accountability, ladies and gentlemen. That's the accountability that we in the, your United States Navy expect of our commanding officers. People who understand their people, stick up for their people, and are responsible and take responsibility for all that takes place within their unit, within their facility, or maybe within their larger institution. 
We give our commanding officers a lot of authority. They take, for example, a submarine to sea. They're responsible for 150 people out on the waves around the world, around this world of our submerged surface. A destroyer, there are 300 people involved. An aircraft carrier, 3,500 people. Commanding officer and aircraft carrier is a mayor in addition to everything else that goes on. So we expect our commanding officers to do a few things. Number one, set the foundation of integrity. You have to believe in your Navy that everybody is telling the truth because your life is gonna depend on it. And if you have a foundation of integrity, that breeds trust, mutual trust. Trust up and down the chain of command and trust across in your shipmates. And with that, in an environment of dignity and respect, you build the character with your sailors that become good leaders, whether they be in the military or leave outside the military. Now, let me give you, if I may, an example of unconditional trust and what I say can be really very much life-threatening or it can save your life. Let's take the example, many of you have seen the movie Top Gun. You look at the movie, you've seen movies where the jet takes off from the aircraft carrier. Let me tell you what takes place right before that jet is launched, going from zero to 160 miles an hour in two seconds. There's an individual in a yellow shirt. Everybody has a shirt on so you know who's doing what. That person's called the shooter. The shooter puts his hand up, starts turning it around, and starts pointing around right before the launch. Points to the fuel person, purple shirt, looking for a thumbs up. It's loaded with the right fuel. Points to the person with the steam catabolic pressure. It's got it right. Points to the ordnance. How much ordnance is on there? How much bombs and whatever? You got the weight right? That's the red shirt. Turns to the white shirt is the tension right. Lastly, turns to the pilot who salutes the shooter and effectively says, my life, this airplane is in your hands. The shooter touches the deck, airplane is launched, and off we go. That's unconditional trust, and that's part of what is built there whenever you know you have the means to know that those, per those people around you have integrity and will, you can trust everything that they tell you in an environment of dignity and respect. So let me take you back to the story. Well, what happened whenever all of this took place? Well, I'll tell you what happened. The commanding officer said, I'm not delivering these letters of reprimand. And they said, well, Captain, come on up to the green table. We're gonna have a talk with you. So he went up and he laid out his case. And they said, you know, you're right. That process isn't right. Those people shouldn't have been held accountable. And the captain did not get a letter of reprimand. That captain went on to finish a 30-year distinguished career in the Navy and a distinguished career also in business. The people that put the valve in, the heroes, they were given medals of commendation for the work that they did in that regard. They changed the procedure on how we put these flanges and how we did maintenance on submarines. They say, okay, well, what about the, the two junior officers? What happened to them? Well, the good news is they didn't get a letter of reprimand either. One of those junior officers moved on, finished his tour in the Navy, and went on to do good things in business. Very happy man in Texas. The other junior officer actually stayed in the Navy. Stayed in the Navy a long time, 40 years. The other junior officer became the chief of naval operations. The other junior officer is me. Because this commanding officer had the integrity, had assumed the responsibility and had the accountability and gave us, we two junior officers, that second chance, we were able to continue on, in my case, with a career that I'm very proud to have served now as your chief of naval operations. So ladies and gentlemen, there's a lesson in here. Integrity is the foundation in any institution, I would tell you, and certainly in our Navy. And with that integrity, you can inbreed a trust among each other that will then breed unconditional trust in an environment of dignity and respect to build the character that we need to build future leaders in our military and in this great nation of ours. So, for those of you that lead out there, for those of you that run institutions, integrity, 
dignity and respect and trust. And you will have leadership that is bold, leadership that is confident in what they can do, and leadership that is accountable. Thank you all very much for this opportunity to address you. All the best.